Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Linwood. If you are joining us online, good morning and welcome. If you're joining us here in the sanctuary, good morning, welcome. Welcome to the unconditional love of God and welcome to this place. We are a community of faith that welcomes all people into God's love and we pray that you feel just a, a small portion of the vastness of God's love this morning so that we might know the height, the depth, the breadth of God's love for us. Just a couple of reminders about um, ways to communicate during our time of worship. If you are new and would like some more information about um, the life of our congregation, take a moment to fill out a connection card. If you're not new, but you've never filled one out before, you might still do that. Um, it allows us to get to know you beyond Sunday morning. If you have a prayer request that you would like to lift up in worship, you can um, find a prayer request card. They're found on the back of the chair in front of you, and then just put it in the basket, the gold one, uh, the offering plate up here during our time of greeting. And now I just invite us to quiet our hearts, to still our minds, to be aware of this new day that God is making for us as we enter into worship, ready to experience God's love again. In that spirit, I'd invite you to stand as you are willing and able. Let's join together in the call to worship. Where you go, I will go. And where, where you stay, stay, I will, I will stay. stay. Your people will be my people, and, and your, your God, God, my God. God. Amazing love, drawing, drawing one, one heart, heart to, to another. another. Amazing love, committing, committing us, us to, to one, one another's, another's care. care. Amazing, unfailing love. This, this is, is the, the love, love of God. God. Let us worship our God who is love. Remain standing if you choose, or sit with gusto as we sing Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Let us show one another a sign of that peace.
This morning's scripture is taken from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So what does God want you to accomplish this year? Ooh. I'm going to take a nap and you think about it. Couldn't resist. Ooh. Yeah. It's a big idea. It really is. I want to begin just by showing you some letters on the screen. When you see those letters, what do you see? God is nowhere. And there's another possibility. God is exactly right. That's exactly the next question. God is now here. It's a slight shift in perspective, isn't it? One letter to the left and it changes everything. God is no longer an absentee landlord. God is the very foundation of being present among us with just a slight change in perspective. We start to see it. We start to experience it. This is exactly what prayer is supposed to do in our lives. It's supposed to shift our perspective so that we can begin to see and experience God. Our ancient spiritual ancestors, some of them like John Wesley, called prayer a means of grace, the place where we can go to quiet the voices of the world, to quiet the voices in our minds, and to begin to hear the voice of the beloved that knows who we are and calls us to be our very best selves. Prayer changes things. How many times have we heard that, right? It shifts our perspective, or at least it's meant to. But I think often we try to keep our prayers very, very tame, very, very small. We pray for things that matter. I'm not saying that, but we pray for temporary situational moments of well-being, right? Well-being emotionally, spiritually, physically, materially for ourselves and for others. And there's nothing wrong with those prayers. They're important. And if they are the inmost prayer of our hearts in that moment, it's exactly what we should be lifting up. But I can't help but think God wants to give us something even more, something even bigger and more vast than these temporary moments of wellness. Do you remember Jesus' words? We find them in Matthew and Luke. He said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And often we've heard those words and we think, fantastic. If we just pray persistently, peskily, in the right way, 
God's going to give us everything we want. Wealth, beauty, vacations, cars, billions of dollars, whatever. It says, ask and it will be given. But the it. <laughs> I got to hear it. What was that? Good eyes. Good eyes. I'd like to have them myself. <laughs> Not yet. Um, but the it, the it that God really wants to offer is the Holy Spirit. You're going to read a little bit further than the first line, right? The Holy Spirit, that divine elixir of love and grace that connects heaven and earth, that has this ability to fill our hearts and minds and lives and make us come alive to who we were created to be in the world. How many of us have ever really prayed, I mean really prayed, even once, with true expectation that God would fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we would know the love of Christ Jesus and experience the fullness of God? I've never prayed it once, not even consistently, with true expectation that this, this is the blessing that God wants to offer us. Nothing less than the fullness of God. Now, we pray for things like, oh, I want to be kinder, I want to be more generous, I want to be slower to anger. We pray for lots of nice things. But I think we're settling. We want to receive the goodness of God in little tiny drops of water that we can manage and control and understand. And God wants to give us an ocean. And I think this is what this prayer from the Apostle Paul is all about. He's praying that his congregation in Ephesus would know nothing less than the full ocean of God's love and presence. Now, it's my favorite prayer in the entire scripture. I love these words, and it's kind of right up there in my top 10 favorite scripture verses of all time. I can't quite get enough of it, right? to imagine that the fullness of God's love might fill us. Paul says that the reason he's praying for this is that he and the congregation are going through trials, difficulties, struggles. He himself has been imprisoned multiple times. He knows he will be imprisoned again. The church in Ephesus is beginning to experience persecution for the way that they live out their faith. They're having doubts. They're wondering if they should continue. And this is the prayer that he offers to try to put all of those struggles into a different perspective so that they come to see those moments in life as part of something bigger, a vast plan of love and grace that God is inviting them to be a part of. He doesn't suggest that they should try so hard to change the circumstance. He asks them to shift their perspective to the presence of God. It strikes me that we don't pray like that in times of difficulty and struggle. I don't. I pray, well, first, I try to change the situation myself, right? That's the first thing. And when that doesn't work, then I turn to God, and I ask God to try to do something with the situation, and that usually also involves me asking God to change the hearts, minds, attitudes, and behaviors of those other people that I really think are responsible for whatever isn't going well for me. I mean, that's just reality, isn't it? But what Paul does instead is to pray that our inmost beings might be fundamentally altered. He prays that our inner core would be strengthened so profoundly by the Holy Spirit that what's going out there on out there, we don't see it in the same way. We don't respond to it 
in the same way. He asks for these things. He asks that the members of the church would be strengthened in their inner being with power through the Holy Spirit. In other words, he asks that we would have a soul so alive with the presence of God that we know exactly who we are, that even when we face difficult decisions, even when we face trials, we have an ethical, moral compass centered right on Christ, and we just keep on going in that same direction. He prays for the indwelling presence of Christ to root and ground every one of them in love. He prays that they would come to believe and trust in the the wildness of God's love for us and that we would have life with the fullness of God. Strengthened in our inmost beings, the indwelling presence of Christ, knowing the power of God's love and having life with the fullness of God. Can you imagine a day with that kind of spiritual power within you? How might we approach work and chores and family, everyday blessings and everyday struggles? I think it might really change everything. So what I've been really thinking about this week is what can we do to put ourselves in that that pathway of God's grace? How can we cooperate with it? I mean, it's God's work in us, but what are the, the faith practices that we might engage in that help truly root and ground us in love and help us experience that aliveness of God's presence? Well, I don't know what might work best for you, but I've thought through my own life, and I think there are two fundamental things that work best for me. The first is beginning and ending every day with prayer and devotion. And the second thing is trying to share love with others. It's how I come to know God's love the best. So I find that I am most rooted and grounded in the love of Christ when I begin and end each day with prayer and devotion. They become bookends, if you will, on my daily experience, kind of like touch points that help me remember my why, my reason for getting up in the morning, my fundamental purpose. And all of us have different things that we do right? We might be caring for our families and our homes. We might be going to the grocery store and doing chores. We might be in a boardroom or sitting at a computer or performing surgeries or working in the classroom. That is part of our purpose. But when we really ground ourselves in daily devotion, I think we remember that really our why is to love. First and foremost, in everything we do, the reason that we are here is to love and to be a part of healing the world with that love. And if we remember that, even on a really bad day where it looks like nothing much is going well, we've accomplished very, very little. I have some days like that. Sometimes you have to review and simply ask, but have I had a moment when I shared love? And if you did, chalk it up to a good day you fulfilled your reason for being, right? We need those moments of touchstones. We need those uh, moments in which we remember our purpose because every human being, no matter how young, no matter how old, needs a reason to get up in the morning. We need it as much as we need water and food and air. And God says our reason for being here is to share this love that we know. Now, it doesn't take all that much. I'm not talking about getting up at 4 a.m. and getting on your knees to pray like John Wesley suggested. I'm talking about reading the upper room or having five minutes of reading a couple of lines of scripture and asking yourself, what is God asking me to do or to be or to change 
in this scripture. Or maybe it's listening to hymns, songs. Maybe it's walking or running and talking to God. That's what I do, and I, yes, I do it out loud. So if you want to like come around the park really early in the morning, you'll hear me talking to myself out loud almost every day. Right? Whatever you do to connect, to find your reason each day. And then at the end of the day, again, we ask ourselves, well, did I do it? Did I share a little love? Did I see a little love? If I didn't, what do I need to do to course correct right now? So bookends of devotion keeps me rooted and grounded in love. And then Paul says that as we do this, we will come more and more to know the love of God that surpasses all knowledge. Well, I've found that I can't know that love in my heart without trying to share it. I can read it in a book and it's head knowledge, and sometimes I'm really excited about what I read in scripture, but I can't know it in my heart until I try to share it. So that can happen in service, in mission, it can happen as we care for one another in our families and neighborhoods with our friends. It can even happen in really, quote unquote, difficult moments. If everybody comes together and says, we are gonna respond to this with grace and courage and respect. We can begin to see that love of God <clears throat> in one another when we do that. I experienced this kind of love just this week when we did our backpack distribution with Tri-Valley Haven. So there were more backpacks than I think I've ever seen, Linda says, maybe 350 backpacks full of supplies, right, representing the care and the connection that people all over the Tri-Valley, beyond this church, other organizations came together to bring these backpacks to those who might need them to help go to school. I saw it in the community of volunteers that were gathered. There were people from Tri-Valley Haven and from our church and also from other organizations. And I saw it in the families that came. We estimate about 100 families came through to be a part of that and receive the backpacks. And it struck me that as we were creating this community of giving, and receiving a community of abundance, that being able to see that even required a shift in perspective. I mean, you could look at the tables and just see materials being exchanged. Well, yep, that's backpacks, full of backpack supplies. Somebody would end about those things, that's what we do, right? We buy stuff. You could see it that way or you could see an opportunity of people extending themselves to try to create relationship, try to create connection, to try to create a community where people know they are valued and their needs will be met by people who care. But you have to shift your perspective a little bit to see it that way. I also realized that we have to shift our perspective in who's giving and who's receiving? Because often when we engage in these kind of things, we stand back at a distance. We are the people who have, and so we give to those in need. And we start to ask interesting questions about them, don't we? Well, I wonder what their lives are like. Do they really have need? Are they making up a story? Are they scamming? What kind of car are they driving? Hmm, I'm not so sure they need this backpack. We all ask those questions. It's not that they're bad questions to ask. We just have to ask what's the impact. The impact is we distance ourselves. We're no longer a community of human beings, loving, giving, and receiving together. We've created a distance between us and them, and we're probably less likely to offer ourselves in service the next time because of the distance we've created with our own questions. There are other questions we could ask. We could ask, 
I wonder how many other community organizations are giving away backpacks right now in this very moment. If I could scan up and get a God's eye view of the world, would I see beams of light and goodness and communities of hope shooting out from every place where backpacks were being distributed? Would I literally see love filling the air? We could learn to ask those questions. And with those questions, we might be filled with a gratitude that we are a part of something bigger. And we might begin to touch the vastness of God's love, to sense the fullness of life with God. Prayer and service, it's meant to ground us in a love that Paul says at the end of this scripture is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Immeasurably more than we could dare to ask or imagine. Do we pray small because we live small? Because we dream small? Because we really don't think that God is at work within us or in others? because we're more aware of our own habits than we are aware of what God might want to do in and through us. St. Irenaeus said the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Fully alive. That's what God wants to offer. God's dream is that we would awaken to this potential within us that each one of us is this unique being put on the planet at a particular time to offer who we are and what we have to the glory of God. And yeah, we're a drop, but the ocean is smaller if we don't offer the drop. That we have to believe the voice of the beloved to do that, right? There are so many voices that tell us things like, you don't really have any great gifts to offer. You should just stay small. Or maybe you have a good gift, but I can't figure out what use it is. Oh, that person over there, they have the gifts we need. Or maybe we've heard a voice that says, you have tremendous gifts, therefore, you should dominate everybody else with those gifts, right? Take all the oxygen out of the room with the focus on you and take all the goodies because you deserve it. You have the best gifts. This isn't what God imagines. God dreams of a world in which we are all aware of our potential to be a part of loving goodness and we just lift it up without concern for the consequence because we trust God and we trust that we're a part of it, right? We can dare bigger dreams. It's God's very slow, very patient, very unexpected way of changing the world one life at a time. So this week as we pray, I want us to really ask ourselves a couple of questions. Ask yourself, what makes you come alive right now? Not what used to make you come alive when you were five, or when you were 10, or when you were 50, right? We know that stuff, right? What makes me come alive right now? Because that's what God is asking you to, to give to the world, right? And then ask yourself, what do you hear God calling you to do? How can you contribute to that goodness, to that love? And let the power of God's love dwell within you, strengthening you, so that you have this inexhaustible resource to handle all the joys, all the blessings, and all the struggles of life. We don't always know we want that. It's not on anybody's top 10 things to pray for, but I think it is really what we need. Amen. i
turn again to this time of prayer, I want to lift up some joys and concerns of our congregation. Um, Amelia asks for prayers for Venezuela and Israel and the Middle East. I would add Ukraine and all of those places that we know of that are experiencing conflict. And There are so many other places of conflict that only God knows. And we pray for that presence to be there. Um, Linda Van Pelt asks for prayers for Carol Ruley and PJ, um, both with health issues this morning. PJ has returned home from the hospital, but Carol is in the hospital this morning waiting for a diagnosis. So I ask for prayers of comfort for her that she would know God's presence um, as she awaits that diagnosis. And also to hold in our hearts and minds the people of Florida knowing that a hurricane is coming uh, their way, that they would know safety and protection and a, a deep sense of community supporting them during that time. I also, I know this doesn't sound very much like a moment of faith, but I want to lift up just the joy of watching the Olympics. And I mean, I love it so much, but I realized this week that what I love even beyond the, the thrill of seeing people do incredible things, right, is that it shows us how amazing and beautiful we can really be. And it is a witness to the best of us in a world where often we see the worst of us on display. And I feel like my faith in people, people coming together, is somehow restored as I watch it. So I have felt really blessed by it. Um, Let's lift up to God all of those prayers, the prayers that we have spoken, the prayers that we know inside. As we enter into this time of prayer, O oh God, we ask that you would help us to let go of whatever is past, to be here with you. Release us from any anger or resentment or hurt of days gone by, free us from any guilt over things we've done or words we've spoken, important things that we've left undone, and help us to fill that space with your love. We offer our gratitude for the gift of love you give. We offer our thanks for those people in our lives who show us that love unconditionally. We offer our thanks for those who provide a safe space so that our, our true deep selves can be revealed. We offer praise for those who give, who are so generous they expect nothing in return for the gift. We offer our gratitude for those people who inspire us to rise up to our best selves and those who put us back together again when things feel broken. We remember those in need of your healing and comforting presence, those who are struggling with illness, those who are struggling with conflict, those who are struggling in the midst of life to make hard choices. Lord, for them and for us, our prayer is that we would know the immensity of your love, the breadth, the length, the height, and depth of it, 
that we would nourish ourselves in that love and that we would overflow with your love toward all the world. Amen. I'm going to invite us into a time of communion, and I, um, I fear that I have gotten up here without my communion liturgy, so I'm really hoping that it all magically appears on the screen. <laughs> or what I say and what you're expecting me to say may be quite different. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them, up them up to the, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right, right to, to give, give thanks, thanks and, and praise. praise. And so we gather at this table to remember the very presence of Christ. To remember, and I'm going to have to pause, all of those things that you're expecting me to respond with, I don't know how we're going to get to those today, so we're just going with this, okay? <laughs> we pause to remember Christ's love, the presence of Christ here in this place. Oh, good, I was kind of good with winging it, but let's do it, okay. <laughs> Always and everywhere we give thanks to God, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before you had formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you are God, the one whom all things and through all things were brought into being. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. Even when we turned away, your love remained steadfast and true. Again and again, you reminded us of our belovedness and sent prophets to help us reclaim our purpose on earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power, power and, might. and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is Jesus our Christ, in whom you reveal yourself and your way. Your spirit anointed him to bring good news to the poor, to bind up broken hearts, and bring freedom to every captive heart. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he blessed and broke it, and he gave it to us, saying, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, and he gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples, saying, drink from this, all of you. This cup represents a new covenant of unending forgiveness for all. As often as you drink of this cup, remember me. And so in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Fill this moment with your presence and nourish our spirits with your grace so that we might be your presence and grace in the world. Amen. For those of you who are worshiping online, you can take bread and juice at home now if you don't have those elements prepared. Any everyday elements can represent the presence of Christ that binds us together. For those of us here in the sanctuary, I want to remind you, as we always do, that this is not the table of the United Methodist Church. This is Christ's table, and he invites us all to come exactly as we are, to receive these simple gifts made extraordinary by his life and his love poured out for us. 
We'd invite you to come forward as the ushers guide you. You can take bread and juice. For those who need a gluten-free option, that's what's found in the center of the plate. And then you can put your cups in the trash cans that you find on either side as you return to your seat. Please come, for all is ready. And those who are helping to um, share in communion, please come forward now.
Thank you, Amelia, for saving me on communion. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, we have quite a few announcements about our community and ways to continue to grow in faith um, beyond Sunday mornings. A uh, reminder that next, uh, next weekend we have two opportunities for worship and fellowship. We have our August 10th event, so that's Saturday from 5 to 7.30. Um, a couple of reminders about that. You will need um, some money for the food trucks, um, but we will provide drinks and other snacks and things like that if you don't want to have dinner at the event. We also need a couple of helpers for setup and takedown, so if you can help with that, you can see Corey um, as you leave, or you can just scan the QR code on the sign, and it'll take you to all the details of what we need um, to do to make that event a success for us and for our community. Um, at the outreach table, you can sign up for the Open Heart Kitchen Vineyard 2.0 tours or two dates for that. Um, also, you can sign up to help with the international brunch that's coming on the 25th of August. And if you don't sign up, I'm pretty sure that some people may track you down and um, make sure that you have something to bring to share in that. Uh, also, we have the Women at the Well tea coming up on August 24th at 11 o'clock. I do not think that you have to be someone who has ever participated in that Wednesday study. We just want you to come and have a wonderful time and be blessed and be a part of it. It will be in the fellowship hall. There will be a guest speaker and some music, and the theme is His Eye is on the Sparrow. You can sign up with Carrie or you can register online for that. Um, also just want you to kind of put a pin and save the date for September 7th at 7 p.m., so that's the first Saturday in September. We will be um, hosting an encore performance of a play called The White Card that Asbury UMC uh, shared in June. This is a play about a woman confronting white privilege and her own thoughts and experiences about that. There'll be some time for discussion afterwards. And um, just to make it even better, um, Kim Reisdorf, who used to serve as our associate pastor here, is part of the play. So it'll be fun to watch her be a part of that as well. Um, the last thing is if you participated in worship, we're trying to figure this out in a better way. If you participated in worship, after the postlude, just come up to the communion table and we will share communion with one another um, after the postlude today. That's all the announcements, I think. I think. Let's stand for our closing hymn.
Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.